Hey, what's up, Life Point Church? Man, I cannot believe six years ago the plan of God was for my wife and our family uh, to come here. Um, we started attending in uh, January of 2016. And again, I couldn't believe the plan of God. I never would have thought um, I would have went from attending to being on staff as a pastor. And I love it here. We've been here six years, and I hope to be here another 36 years in Jesus' name. But I have a question for you. Have you ever had this question asked to you, do you have plans tonight? Now, depending on who asked you the question determines typically your response. Some of us lie. <laughs> of course I have plans tonight. Well, if you're like me, you know, uh, sometimes I'll be like, yeah, we ain't got nothing going on. And then I ask my wife, and she's like, yes, we planned this for like for four years. <laughs> well, planning is something that takes time, it takes energy, it takes effort. And you may have heard it said that if you fail to plan, then you've planned to fail. Now, how many of you are planners up in here? Like, you got to have a plan. Now, I personally like plans, but I also like to call audibles like Peyton Manning. Like, I, they kind of sometimes feel like they lock me in. I don't have any flexibility. But I will say this, if it's my idea, then I can envision the plan happening. Like, for example, I had a plan to be a rapper. And clearly, I've had to make some adjustments in life. Now, a lot of us have had life plans, and we've had to alter, we've had to make some adjustments, we've had to pivot, we've had to change. And all of us here, three years ago in February, we had plans, and we were on the cusp of all those plans being changed forever. And then we made adjustments. We started watching Tiger King. <laughs> Carol Baskins. <laughs> That's dumb. Can you believe that we spent part of our lives watching that? My favorite part of the whole entire episode was when he said, I'm never gonna financially recover from this. <laughs> I use that all the time with my kids with the thermostat. I'm like, come on now. Anyways, well, in my own life, I've had to pivot. I've had to make adjustments. And what I envisioned my life looking like at 40, 20 years ago, hasn't necessarily gone to plan. And as I mentioned, I wanted to be a rapper. And uh, there was a moment in my life where I actually did shows as a rapper. When I say this out loud, it's really humorous. Uh, but I had a concert uh, or a show in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I met some other rappers that were going to be a part of it in Nashville, and I rode with them to go do this show. It was on New Year's Eve almost 20 years ago, and it was at the Peabody Hotel, and I, I was a Christian rapper. Come on, somebody. Got to rap about Jesus. Um, but it was for a camp college campus ministry. They're having a New Year's Eve party. And so we did the show, and the plan was to get up early the next morning, get back to Nashville, because I wanted to watch. I think that's back when the Tennessee Vols were actually really good at football at that time. Hey, we're getting better in Jesus' name. But the plan was to get back home. So we take off early, and as we're dry, riding down the road, we don't get out of Little Rock for very long, and his car, one of the other rappers' cars, breaks, breaks down. And so... It happened to break down right next to O'Reilly's auto parts store. You would think that was God like helping us out. And um, he had said, hey, I just need to buy this part real quick, change it out, we'll be back on the road. So I went over to Hardy's, got me a breakfast, come back. And then at 6 p.m. that night, I decided we needed another plan because this car wasn't fixed. And I decided that I was going to get a ride to the Greyhound bus station and get me a one-way ticket back to Nashville. And I guess all the other rappers um, liked that plan as well. Even the guy that owned the car, he liked it as well. He abandoned his car at that O'Reilly's. And we got a ride from the O'Reilly's auto parts manager in a single cab truck 
four of us rappers piled into it. And I remember I sat right next to the manager and he's like, boys, we're going to get you over there. We're going to get you there now. I don't know if you can visualize for wannabe rappers. <laughs> Anyways, again, looking back, I probably could have um, realized that maybe this wasn't God's plan for my life, that he had different plans for my life. But have you considered God's plan for your life? There's no doubt that many of us here have considered that. Some of us probably would confidently say that I'm following God's plan for my life, while others you may be unsure. And there be maybe some people in here, if you were really honest, you would probably say, I'm not following God's plan for my life. However, what if I submitted to you that sometimes our best attempts at life plans fail, but God's plan will prevail? Well, today I've entitled the message, God's plan will prevail. And all throughout Acts, you see that God has a plan, and that plan will prevail. Whether it's through supernatural events or seemingly insignificant events, God has a plan, and that plan will prevail. Even through disappointment, adversity, and pain, his plan prevails. God is in control even when we don't feel like it, even when we don't see him moving, he's moving. And today I want to jump in the middle of a narrative in Acts chapter 23, verse 12. It's about the Apostle Paul. He's currently in jail. And you're about to find out there's two different plans. There's God's plan for his life, and then there's the plan of these men. However, before we jump into it, I'd like to give you just a quick, nerdy, historical, biblical recap of where we're at right now. Now, the book of Acts is about the acts of the disciples, the apostles. It's how the gospel of Jesus Christ spread throughout the world, how it went to Jerusalem and from Jerusalem to Rome. Acts is full of actions, supernatural events, sometimes not so supernatural. But again, it's about God's plan prevailing. And Paul finds himself uh, going to Jerusalem, he's an apostle of God. He's going to go to Jerusalem. Before he goes to Jerusalem, though, he, he receives these warnings, these prophetic warnings, that if you go, chains are going to await you, like you're going to be in jail. Nevertheless, he feels like God wants him to go, so he goes to Jerusalem. He hasn't been in Jerusalem in 20 years. But upon his arrival, he begins to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the Jews, the religious leaders of those days, they did not like what Paul was communicating. And so a riot broke out. And the Romans had um, occupied, they were occupying Israel. And so they were intervening. And riots, religious riots, were not something that was new. So the Romans were kind of used to intervening um, on the behalf of the Jews, um, trying to make sure that these riots don't continue. And people don't get hurt. And Paul is like being taken away by the Romans, uh, the soldiers. And he's like, hey, let me address the crowd one more time. I think I can persuade them. So he does, and it doesn't work. He gets taken back into the uh, custody, into uh, basically a jail cell. And the Roman officer is going to have him beaten. And then Paul is like, I I'm, a I'm a Roman. Like, are you going to beat a Roman? And then the Roman officer is like, you're a Roman? No, I'm not going to beat a Roman because it was illegal for them to do that. And then Paul is trying to talk them into letting them go talk again to the Jews. So they, he goes and talks again. And then this time, one section of the religious folks actually like what Paul's saying. The other section of the religious folks do not like it. And then they get in a physical fight amongst one another. I mean, can you imagine you come into church, this side of the church gets in a fight with this side of the church physically. It kind of gives you a mental picture of kind of what's happening in this biblical context. <laughs> Anyways, I don't know if you've ever seen a church fight before. But this is going down and the Roman officer to protect Paul and keep him safe takes him back to jail. 
And so we find ourselves in this text, Acts chapter 23, and we see this plan unveil, God's plan and then the plans of man. And the first thing that I want you to see today is that the heart is deceitful. The heart is deceitful. So let's jump right into the text. This is Paul, he's in jail, and it says, when it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. Now we hear a lot about conspiracies these days and it's sometimes hard to differentiate between fact and fiction. However, these specific men have conspired along with the religious Sadducees or the religious leaders of that day to plot and kill Paul. And the irony here is that the hunter has now become the hunted. Paul, at one time of his life, killed Christians. And now he is the one that's being hunted for his faith. And they believe, these 40 plus guys believe, that Paul is worthy of death because they're convinced he's against the Jewish nation, he's against their law, therefore he is against their God. However, because the Romans took him back to protect him, and he is now in their custody. After that last disagreement, the religious leaders come up with another plan. So these men of God go to the chief priests and the elders and said, we've strictly bound ourselves by an oath. Everybody say oath. To taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now therefore you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune. The tribune is the Roman officer to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. And we are ready to kill him before he comes near. Now, here's what's crazy. They take an oath. This oath, actually Pastor Mike actually told me this, this oath was probably a blood oath. It's a religious oath. They believe that God's plan for their life is to conspire to kill. And what's really surprising is that when they go to the religious leaders and unveil their plan, they're like, you know what? Yeah, first degree murder, let's do it. They believe that this is a good plan as well. And so they believe that taking this oath by fasting, I mean, we just came out of a time of fasting and praying. And they believe they're going to honor God by getting rid of Paul. They literally believe this is God's plan for their life. Which, you have to understand, these people know the Ten Commandments by heart. And they have just completely ignored the Sixth Commandment that says, Thou shalt not murder. Like, they're just ignoring that. They justify their murderous plot because they believe that Paul is spreading a false message about their nation, about their people, and about their God. They don't want to hear the truth. They just want to kill the messenger of truth. And they ultimately don't trust God's plan. And the reality is you can be passionate about the wrong thing. You can have a passion that's misdirected. You can have godly zeal and it be misdirected. Now we all know probably some really faithful religious folks right now that get caught up in conspiracies and they get really passionate about it. And look, I fully believe this. God will never, you, never, God will never contradict his written word to give you permission to sin. He'll never give you He'll never give you permission to sin and contradict his written word. God doesn't give you a pass for sin for any sake or cause. God forgives you of sin, but he does not give you permission to sin, to accomplish his will, his purposes, or his plan. And if you believe that, you're actually deceived. And these 40 dudes are completely deceived into thinking they're doing God's work. And it's easy on this side, like 2,000 years after this happened, it's easy to be critical. However, 
How often do we think that our sin is acceptable to God? That somehow God understands. And we hear about this a lot in our culture, like, he knows my heart. He actually does know your heart. That's why in Jeremiah, he spoke through the prophet and he said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This right here is why you need Jesus. This is why you need a savior. It's because oftentimes we think we know better than God. And I would submit to you that we need to devote ourselves, our agendas, our emotions, our passions through God-ordained filters. One is God's written word. Two would be wise counsel. Three would be the Holy Spirit. And I know in my own life, I've made some mistakes. I've committed some sin. And you know what I, I have found? is oftentimes I bypass those filters because those filters take work. And I could have saved myself some heartache. I could have saved myself some pain. I could have saved others heartache and pain. But I didn't filter them. If I would have just done two out of the three, and then I'd probably add a fourth filter, your spouse. Oftentimes there's been, actually, there's been probably too many than I would care to admit, but if I would have just bypassed or talked it over with my wife, I probably could have saved myself some heartache and pain. And so these 40 plus dudes, these, these men of God, if you will, don't go through any God ordained filters. They just want to commit murder. I mean, think about this for a second. We're not talking about self-defense. We're not talking about like a military battle or war. They just simply want to get rid of God's messenger. And the real issue with our heart and the wickedness of our heart is the depth. It's how deep, it's how far we're willing to go. And if you think about it this way, you know, the ocean is dangerous, right? Because of the depth, the undertow. I don't know if you've ever felt it before, but I, I, um, when I was a youth pastor, we took some students to the, uh, to the beach and we're out like pretty far out by a sandbar. And then next thing you know, we're getting drifted further and further out. And it was a little scary in that moment. And again, it's the depth. The issue is not like the love of money. It's the depth of the love of money. It's what you're willing to do to either get more, like to cheat on your taxes or cheat other people. It's the depth of it. It's like withholding generosity. It, the issue with lust is the depth. It's what you're willing to do to justify your lust. Like, it's just flirting with a coworker, no big deal. Like you'll justify watching porn. You'll justify having the adulterous affair. And I know this is tough. I know this is heavy, but we oftentimes will justify our sin. I heard one time uh, from a pastor not long ago who uh, a guy in his church came to him and he said, I feel that God has released me from my spouse. And he had no biblical reason to get divorced. And the pastor responded with, I don't think you feel a release from God. I think you feel a release in your flesh. And again, God's never going to contradict his written word. When I was a youth pastor, I, I had a student come to me one time. I was like, man, I was praying and God told me to move in with my girlfriend. I looked at him and I said, man, don't lie on God. You are lying. But we'll justify our sin. Again, the issue is the depth. And if you're honest with yourself, you can't trust your heart. Now, we've seen through, all throughout church history, uh, men of God have done evil. They've deceived themselves. 
They've done evil in God's name. And I believe that's why another Ten Commandment is don't use God's name in vain. Don't use it for dishonest gain. Don't use it. Don't deceive people. But you know what? It doesn't matter if you're on the right side or the wrong side of truth. God's plan will still prevail. His plan will still prevail. And look, the second thing I think you're going to see today is that God will use anyone and anything. He'll use anyone and anything. He'll, I'll even say he'll use anyone, anything, in any circumstances as well. Y'all remember, I got on that Greyhound bus, right? And we went to the back of the bus, and we were just cutting up, trying to make the most of a tough situation. So we started freestyle rapping. Come on, somebody. I don't know how good I, how good I was, but I, E for effort. But we're freestyling in the back, we're rapping, we're cutting up. And I remember somebody turned around and was like, are y'all rapping about Jesus? I said, we sure are. I started preaching the gospel, y'all. We started having revival on the back of a Greyhound bus. Let me tell you something. So much so that the bus driver pulled over because he thought something was wrong. And I said, nothing is wrong. We're just having a revival service. I mean, I did an altar call. Five people gave their lives to Jesus. It was powerful. It was powerful. And look, God will use anyone in anything. And you're going to see in just a second who God uses. Let's jump back into the text. It says, now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush. This is Paul's nephew. So he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions, this is a Roman uh, soldier, and said, Take this young man to the tribune, the Roman officer, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you, as he has something to tell you. The tribune took him by the hand, going aside, asked him privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than 40 of their men are lying in ambush for him, who have bound themselves by a religious oath neither to eat nor drink till they've killed him. And now they are ready waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you have informed me of these things. God's plan prevails through Paul's unnamed nephew. We know he's young because the scriptures describe him as a young man. We're not sure how old, and we're really not sure how he even got to Jerusalem. Because Paul is from Tarsus. It is uh, modern-day Turkey. So how his family got into Jerusalem, we don't know if they just like, hey, a weekend trip, got an Airbnb, and they just ha happened to be hanging out. We just don't know. We don't know the circumstances of why Paul's nephew happened to be at the right place at the right time to hear this murderous plot. But God's plan involves what seems to be random events and somehow sovereignly aligns it with his will. And God can use an infinite number of options to accomplish his will in our lives. So God sometimes uses circumstances that seem to be unexpected, seems to use unexpected people, and in that situation, he carries out his plan and his purpose. And God had promised Paul, you're gonna go to Rome and you're gonna testify about me. However, God's plan used the actions of his nephew to expose the evil plot. And if you're a student here today, or you're a young adult here today, or you're a child here today in the auditorium, God wants to use you. You have value in the kingdom of God. And just like Paul's nephew, you can stand up for what is right. You could do the hard right thing. And you have to think about it. This nephew knows that there's 40 plus guys that are plotting to kill his uncle. He could have easily been like, man, you know what? Snitches get stitches. 
I don't know if I should have used that, but <laughs> nevertheless, he's probably thinking like, if these guys have plotted to kill my uncle, what are they going to do to me when they find out that I ratted on them? But he disregards that. He has courage and he goes and he makes the report. And next, God's plan prevails because he uses the actions of a non-believing, pagan, Greco-Roman officer named Lysias and part of the Roman army as well. Check this out. Then he called two of the centurions and said, get ready, 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. This is in the middle of the night. Also provide mounts or a horse for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. Now check out the plan of God. The plan of God used a Roman officer. That Roman officer used 200 infantrymen, 70 mounted horses, cavalry, and then another 200 spearmen to protect one dude, one person. So God's plan prevailed by using secular pagan government to achieve his purpose. These soldiers thought they were transporting a prisoner and they didn't realize that they were transporting God's preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some of you here are wondering why God would send you to Fort Campbell or send you to Romania or send you to Germany or Japan or wherever the government is sending you. And you need to realize that you're on assignment from God. You are in the Lord's army, even though that may sound corny. And God has an assignment and a plan for your life. And you are a missionary with a purpose to preach the gospel no matter where he sends you. Because he will use an infinite number of options to accomplish his will in your life. And I have found that God is often working behind the scenes when we're totally unaware. That's why Romans 8.28 says that your life, like he is working out it for the good of those that are called according to his purpose, that love him. God's plan was to use a letter as well. Lysias starts writing a letter on the behalf of Paul. And this is just the next stop for Paul's plan or God's plan for Paul. It's a practical move to further a spiritual message. So he used a young man, he used a Roman officer, he uses the army, and now he's using a letter. And God will use anything. Check out this letter that Claudius writes. He said, I wrote this letter to this effect. Claudius Lysias, this is just like a formal uh, Roman name for a Greek that bought his Roman citizenship and is giving honor to Caesar. That's just a real nerdy historical context for all the nerds in here. Can I get an amen? Some of you are like, I'm not saying amen to that. It says, to his excellency, the governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. Now, I don't know if you remember back in the text, but it didn't exactly go down like this. But nevertheless, he's writing this on the behalf of Paul. And he continues, and desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving of death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. Now, I'm convinced of this. If God wants you somewhere, he will make a way for you to get there. He'll use a letter. He'll use a, 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 an army. He will use any means necessary. The question is, will we be available? Will we be available? Will we have the courage Will we be faithful even when the plan is not go going according to our plan? You see, Paul, if you put yourself in Paul's shoes, he doesn't know what's on this letter. 
he's having to wait in anticipation to see how am I going to get to Rome? And he has to be faithful in his waiting season. And that's because God's plan looks different. Look, I had a plan to be a rapper, y'all. Pastor Mike had a plan to be an opera singer. Those plans were changed because God got a hold of our lives. And think about this for a second. A guy that's 6'6 and is built like an offensive lineman, goes to the University of Tennessee, and he's an opera singer? I remember when I first met him and I was like, an opera singer? It's like, man, I did not see that one coming. And then I got to thinking about this. What if we did a concert and I rapped and he did opera? That's never been done in the history of music, y'all, I don't think. I don't know. I think the Grammys come on tonight. <laughs> Maybe we should collab, you know. Pastor Mike would be like, Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. That's not even how you say it, is it? I don't know. Oh. So dumb. Anyways, God's plans change. God's plan looks different than ours. Let's get back to the text. Let's focus. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipratus. I think I said that correctly. And on the next day, they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go with him. And when they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul also before him. And on reading the letter, he asked what province he was from. And when he learned that he was from Sicilia, which is in modern-day Turkey, it's a province. Tarsus is the Roman capital city inside that province. He said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's Poratorium. This is King Herod's palace that was built on the coast of the Mediterranean. And so he's going to be guarded in that palace, and he's going to await God's next plan for his life. Paul never thought he'd be back in Caesarea. Caesarea is the place where he received the prophetic warning from Agabus that was a little weird about what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And the only directive that he received from Jesus is when Jesus showed up in the jail cell with him in Jerusalem. And he said, take courage, for as you have testified about the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify about me in Rome. And here's what I've learned about being a follower of Jesus. It requires faith, it requires courage, and it requires flexibility. Faith, courage, and flexibility. For some of us, our life plan has not gone as expected. We've had a career change. Maybe we've given up on a dream. Maybe we're going through a difficult divorce, and maybe we're going through tragedy. And I want to encourage you to see these unexpected life changes as opportunities to God to move in your life. I want to share with you about a couple who started attending LifePoint in 2016, about the same time Rachel and I started attending here at LifePoint. The church was in the process of remodeling, so we were actually not in this location. We were at West Creek Middle School. This couple that I'm talking about, they're Names are Al and Emily Burlow. They were both active duty soldiers invited by Emily's first sergeant to come check out LPC. Now, Al was completely against coming to church, but he wasn't going to let his family go somewhere without him. And so he reluctantly came angry at God, didn't see the need to come. Emily, on the other hand, was just a little bit more apathetic towards God, but wanted to check it out. And I can actually remember when Al and Emily started coming. I remember actually cracking a joke in front of Al, and he just stood there like this. I was like, hmm. <laughs> remember walking away thinking, man, that guy is dealing with something. And what I didn't know is Al was dealing with grief. His anger was directed at God. Because in 2013, 
God had blessed Emily and Al with triplets. Whew. Just thinking about triplets is tough. But they blessed him. See, that's, that's the difference when you get God with you. You see that every gift of life is a blessing. They were born premature, two girls and a boy. And unfortunately, after eight months of them being prematurely born, their boy, Gabe, passed away at the beginning of 2014. So you could possibly understand why Al was struggling with anger, reluctant to come to church, and Emily was searching for a why. Why did this happen? She said, I came to the conclusion I may never understand why. They said, looking back, they can actually see God was with them the whole time, even though they were unaware. Now, I want you to check out how God's plan for Alan Emily looks different. Emily was set on finishing her army career and retiring. However, after Gabe's passing, she decided to leave active duty and pursue a career in nursing. She now works at the same hospital on the exact same floor where Gabe passed away. And recently, she was taking care of, fam of a family who unexpectedly 24 hours after giving birth, their child passed away. Emily began to answer some of the questions that the family had. They had a puzzled look on their faith, face and she began to say, I know exactly how you feel because my son passed away in this exact same location in this exact same hospital. Emily said in that moment, it seemed like the family got a sense of peace. It didn't remove the grief and the pain, but at least they had somebody there with them to walk through the grief and pain. You see, God's plan looks different. Al, on the other hand, retired from the army. He spent 12 years in the Marines. I mean, this dude's a bad man in my jam, I'm just saying. But you know where Al works now? After retirement, LifePoint Church. Al is a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to see Al's life change, to like witness it, is amazing. Pastor Mike was sharing me just earlier, like, you know, today is Baptism Sunday. And he said, I remember the day that Al got baptized. He was in the parking lot, in his vehicle, arguing with God for 20 minutes. 20 minutes, not 20, 20 minutes. He's arguing with God, right? And he comes in and he's mad at God and they're actually breaking down the baptistry and he goes up to Pastor Mike and he's like, I'm ready to get baptized. And he gets baptized and God has radically changed Al and Emily Burlow. I can even remember when they came to our our. Uh, we had a marriage conference and I remember them sitting really close to us and I've just seen them just totally God work a plan in their life. And here's the thing, God is no respecter of person. What God would do for Al and Emily, he could do it for you too. So I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what pain, adversity, tragedies you're going through, but I do know you have a God that cares for you. He wants to be close to you. And he has a plan for your life. And because we live in a fallen world, because we have sin, sometimes things don't go to plan. But we have hope in Jesus. And look, I was driving to church this morning and I was like, you are my hope, God. Like I am all in with you. No matter what life circumstances may come my way, I love you, Jesus. And I just, there's, I don't understand everything. There's some questions that I have, but one question I've answered is the fact that Jesus is who he says he is. Like, I don't have to debate that anymore in my life. And I wanna encourage you this morning, God has an infinite number of options of accomplishing his will in your life, but it will require the courage to stand up and do the right thing to preach the gospel. And here's the thing, all of you in this room right now are preachers of the gospel, whether you realize it or not. 
If you are a follower of Jesus, you're a preacher of the gospel. You are in the ministry. You may not get a paycheck from a church, but you're in the ministry. So if you're a gym owner, you're in the ministry. Every person that comes in, they get to hear the Christian music playing on the speakers. They get to see that, that this is a place where I can find Jesus. If you're in the army, again, you're in the ministry. And I would dare say that you have more of an opportunity to reach people that are far from Jesus than maybe even me. You have, I mean, like what, there's 30,000 soldiers on Fort Campbell? I don't know. I don't know if I just made that up on the spot, but it sounded good. That's 30,000 souls that need Jesus. And maybe God's brought you here for a, such a time as this. God's plan will prevail. Amen. I want to encourage you to pray a prayer like this uh, as we go into a new week. God, help me to see you today, even in the little insignificant moments of life. Help me to see you. Amen. Hey, will you stand to your feet? I hope this message today has encouraged you and uplifted you, but I wanna do this. If you're far from God right now, I just want you to pray this prayer after me. And then after that, if you need prayer for anything, we have a prayer team here at the front. Actually, Emily Burlow is up here right now. She would love to pray with you. Well, I, why don't we do this? Just lift up your hands symbolically to the Lord. Pray this prayer after me. Jesus, I'm all in. I'm all in on your plan for my life. I may not understand, but I trust you. Help me see you in the little moments of life. I accept what you did on the cross for me that you forgave me of sin. Now, Jesus, lead me by your spirit. In Jesus' name.